So what's your process? Do you have a particular process for learning content? You know, this, everyone's talking about the latest, greatest. And in, in machine learning, especially, there's always the latest, greatest. There's a new method coming out for neural networks every other week. How many of those have long-term lasting value? I, I'd say only a small percentage of them. But fundamentally, we need to focus, at least from my perspective, I like to focus on the main ideas. Josh Starmer, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I can't believe you're here and that I get to speak to you in an interview. I've been excited about this uh, for so long. Where in the world are you calling in from, Josh? Uh, I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Nice. Uh, we're filming in the winter. I suspect that winter in North Carolina is pretty idyllic. Uh, it's relatively mild, but for some reason, we've been getting snowstorms for the past two weeks, and I think we're going to get another <sighs> one. So it's a little bit of a bust this year, but usually it's it's nice. It's like highs in the 50s and lows in the 30s, but, you know, relatively good sunshine. So I like it. Uh, yeah, I guess it all just melts away right away anyway. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, cool. So we know each other through Matt Dancho. So Matt was a guest on episode number 463 of the program. He runs a educational platform called Business Science, creates lots of great educational videos on uh, particularly R as a tool for, uh, for slicing and dicing data, for running statistical analyses. And it sounded from the email intro that he made that you might have collaborated with him in the past. Yeah, we, we've done a couple of videos together. Matt, I'll be honest, Matt has been a huge help for me. When I first left wow. my job to do uh, YouTube full time, he was like yeah. holding my hand those first couple of months. He would call, he would check in like, how are you doing? You know, let's do something together. Let's, you know, here's some tips on how to get going. And so he was super helpful and very encouraging and, and, wow. and a big, a big sort of like, uh, a big part of of sort of like my ability to to th keep a positive mindset and think, oh, I can make this work because Matt's helping me out. So that was a it was just a huge help. And it has clearly made a big difference. I mean, so I could imagine six years ago when you were starting out creating the StatQuest YouTube channel that, you know, you, you don't know how things are going to be. And, and I understand that. I mean, I'm kind of I recently started making videos and you're like, I think I'm making good content, but no one's really watching it. And now you're in a different scenario because now you have 650,000. And I was, I was like, yesterday I looked at your YouTube channel because I was like, okay, 650,000. Today I looked 651,000. And that's probably like, that, that is probably about your growth rate. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, thousands of people per week uh, subscribing to your channel. You've created tons of amazing videos. As the name implies, there's a lot of statistics in the channel, um, including, you know, you, you'll dive, you'll do a whole video series on specific aspects of stats, like regression models, for example. Um, but you also have lots of videos on machine learning and machine learning in general, like what does it mean, training, set, training sets versus test sets, um, cross-validation, so these general machine learning principles, but then also you've done video series on specific techniques. So neural networks, like deep learning neural networks. Uh, and I, it is unsurprising to me that you have so many followers because you have amazing visual explanations. You clearly put a lot of time into not only figuring out how to convey the information effectively, but then how to visualize it and create a really crisp video. So without dumbing anything down, you have these visual explanations with clear steps. You tell the viewer, this is exactly what other videos you're gonna to need to watch before you tackle this one. And I, it is no surprise to me that people love the channel so much. Uh, you have several videos with over a million views, including ones on principal component analysis, on logistic regression. In case it isn't obvious to the listener already, if there's any topic that you're looking to shore up in statistics or machine learning, the first place to look is Josh's channel to see if he's made the video on that yet because that is the way to learn it. Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and uh, it's not just stats and machine learning. You also have some original songs on the channel. 
So you are a musician. I, I know for sure you play a cello, a ukulele, you're a vocalist. What other instruments do you have uh, in, in the bag, so to say? Oh, you got a piano behind you there? Got a, I've, I've got those tabla drums. I haven't played them in a long time, but I've got a, <laughs> I've, I've got a, um, a guitar. I've got a mandolin. I've got a banjo. Um, I, I've been playing the bass a little bit lately. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I used to, you know, the guitarist loves to make fun of the bassist, as obviously you can joke that if you can already play guitar, of course you can play a bass. Um, now a really good bassist is is something else, but. Um, well, I have I have a secret uh, actually that people not pity. Just I'm only going to tell you. Nobody else will know. I don't actually <laughs> I don't actually know how to play a real guitar. Um, so the ba- <laughs> so the bass is a real stretch for me. It's very different. Uh, I play wow. I play uh, I play a tenor guitar, uh, which is Whoa. only it only has four strings, so you can uh, wow. and it's tuned in fifth. So it's 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 a the lowest note is C, G, D. And A, <laughs> uh, and it's only four strings, and it's tuned just like a cello. So if you grew up playing the cello, wow. you can play the tenor guitar just like out of the box. You don't have to learn anything. But when if you give me a six string guitar, I'll just look at it and like and be very scared <laughs> because it's got six strings, and that scares me. That's so all. Of, so you mentioned mandolin, ukulele. Those are all four string instruments. Uh, do they all have the same tuning or did you have to learn at least some other tuning? A ukulele surely is different from a tenor guitar. Just like it's it's I mean, it's like the the top four strings on a guitar. Uh, the mandolin is also tuned in fifths and I'm natural in fifths. So like mandolin was like, dang, I can do that. It all started. <laughs> it all started because I play the cello and the cello is a great instrument. I love the cello, but it's huge and it's terrible to transport. And, right. um, and if you want to go like backpacking, you can't take a cello backpacking. <laughs> um, so the first instrument I got was this thing called, a, I got a mandolin and, and that was super fun and I loved it. But then I, I found these tenor guitars and they're just, they're just magic. I, that's all I pretty much play these days. Cool. I, I don't suppose, I mean, the listener now knows that you've got a tenor guitar right there. I mean, could you just play a little melody for us on it? I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, I can play. So there's a, there's a, um, just to give you a sense of like the crossover between the tenor guitar and the cello is one of the most popular cello pieces is the Bach, uh, G major cello suite. And it kind of goes. Oh yeah. Uh, and so it's really easy to anything I can do on the cello, I can do on this guitar. Uh, but it's also, uh, because it's, uh, it's the chords are super straightforward. There's really only like two shapes and your bar chords, you only have to cross four strings instead of six. So it doesn't take much muscle at all. Um, I, I highly recommend it. Um, it doesn't sound as rich as a full six string guitar because, because, uh, uh, not not to get all geeky about guitars and tunings, <laughs> but the, str- the 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 distance in pitch between the strings on the tenor is wider than on a guitar, and that closeness right. that closeness in the harmonies that you get on a guitar contributes to a sound of warmth and like richness, and you don't get this. This is a, a slightly colder, icier sound. Uh, it's not as warm um, and rich. Then so. To me, a cello does sound really rich, however. Is that because I'm I'm used to hearing it with other instruments as well, perhaps? Well, it's just because the, the cello is a big, huge monster instrument with like right. so many overtones coming at you. It's these thick strings right. just just getting vibrated like crazy. And as a result, it's gonna it's just this dark, woody instrument. Um, and it's gonna mm-hmm. sound super rich just by its it's the way it's been built. Uh, but but if you're strumming, what I, I guess what I'm talking about is when you're strumming chords, right, uh, right, you, right, right? You get a you get a much more open sound on the tenor, and you get a much closer, sort of richer thing on a guitar. But a cello almost is always very rarely do you play chords on a cello. So that was a kind of a new thing for me. A cello is right. almost all all melody. That was actually that was going to be my next question: Is do you ever play chords on a cello? That does happen sometimes. 
Ah, it does. Uh, uh, yeah, it does. Uh, in <laughs> fact, those Bach cello suites that are that are pretty popular are yeah. are uh, have have a lot of chord stuff in it. But it's rare, and it's and it's and and one of the big differences in sort of learning how to play music as a put on the cello versus my tenor guitar, which I'll just call a guitar for now because the concepts are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, on the cello, I th you think of everything in terms of melody. Uh, and on the guitar, you think in terms of chords, someone just says, oh, you just play D G A C. And on the cello, I'd be like, uh, what is <laughs> yeah, just play a G yeah, I like, for, uh, for four beats. Yeah. Just so, a single note. Exactly. So that was a tough transition to, to, to just wrap my brain around thinking about songs in terms of chords, as opposed to songs in terms of melodies. Right. Um, and, uh, and I think, I, I think that melody when like I do write my own music, um, and I, and not just, I obviously to clarify, uh, a lot of people know me as the guy who sings a silly song at the start of all my videos, but I actually do like <laughs> serious music. And, and when I do my serious music, I think of it, uh, I think, in I, I, I think of it as layers of melodies rather than chords. Right. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that shows how much more sophisticated you are with music than me, because for me, so my dream, so I'm a rhythm guitarist. I, I, I sing and I play rhythm guitar in, in rock bands. That's really all I ever did, except that I could trivially play the bass if I had to and have done it. Uh, cause then, it, cause then it's the same. Cause it's like, cause I see the chord charts and I'm like, well, I'll just play, I will play G just for this whole bar. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. So for me, yeah, it's the dream. I have this uh, this amazing. So I love the Beatles. Everyone, I, I think pretty much everyone loves the Beatles. It's it's a cliche, but I love the Beatles too, just like everyone else. And I have this Beatles chord songbook that I bought like almost two decades ago. Um, I grew up in Canada, so I was still living in Canada when I bought this. And then I went to Oxford and did my PhD there. And this. I have so this chord songbook of all the Beatles songs. It is it's comprehensive, and the the person who did it did it an impeccable job. This guy's name is Ricky Rooksby, and so Ricky Rooksby he he because because to do it very well, especially when you're converting melodies like somebody playing a melody on a guitar as opposed to just strumming chords, to convert that into a sensible chord and have it work, uh, that that requires a lot of ingenuity. And so Ricky Rooksby did it immaculately in this book. When I started at Oxford in, so you might not know this about me, but like you, I used to be in genomics. So my PhD was in neuroscience, but I was specialized in creating machine learning algorithms or statistical algorithms, much like you, to analyze genomic data and brain imaging data. And so anyway, the, the genomic center in Oxford is, is a bit away from the center of town. And it's in this area called Headington, uh, outside of Maine, Oxford. And we get this email sent around the genomic center saying, guitarist teacher seeking students. Ricky Rooksby lived a few minutes walk from the genomic center and I had guitar lessons from him and he signed my book and oh, we're man. still in touch. That's so yeah. cool. Wow. When I talk to leaders in data science, I notice they all make time for learning and encourage the same of their teams. But with your actual everyday work to do, all day trainings aren't possible for most of us. That's why an on-demand learning platform like Udemy Business makes sense. With Udemy Business, you can access over 500 cutting edge data science courses taught by real world subject matter experts and validated by other learners' real time reviews. Amongst these 500 courses, you'll find my own Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course, as well as dozens of mega popular courses from other super data science instructors. To hear the latest on the state of data science in the workplace and discover how you can democratize data science learning in your teams through Udemy Business, check out the new video series called Insights on Demand, Diving into Data Science. To watch this series and learn more, visit business.udemy.com SDS. That's business.udemy.com SDS. So yeah, we have digressed a lot. People came here for stats and all they're getting is tenor guitars. Um, oh, well, 
Um, so yeah, so you do, so the reason why we got here is because your Stats Quest channel does also have some original songs and it also has some covers. Um, so I particularly love this Psycho Killer, Qu'est-ce que c'est? Yeah, got into that. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, even your, your videos, you break up, I mean, you break up uh, technical content with, with levity in a lot of ways. So your tone of voice, it creates levity and enjoyment. You have musical jingles that you'll interlude with or start or end videos with. And um, you also have, you have a catchphrase that is brilliant on so many levels, Josh. So for marketing purposes, for ease of marketing, for memorability for listeners, just for creating that levity in videos, and also then for creating social media engagement, it's just a single syllable. Damn. Can't, can't remember, what is that? <laughs> Damn, exactly. Damn. <laughs> and then I love, and then, yeah, so then, see, so I even saw it when I, I asked listeners if they had questions for you. And so I, I wrote this post uh, on LinkedIn and it's ended up being, we're gonna get to, to audience questions later uh, at the end of the episode, but it's it's the most viewed post I've ever made. And and part of what's driven the social media engagement is people writing BAM <laughs> as comments and and then people replying that and saying double BAM, which is another. And then I oh, I don't want to I don't want to work in a triple BAM too early into this episode, but maybe we'll say something of such significance that will will merit it. Yes, let's um, say that. <laughs> um so yeah so again clearly uh your channel is one that i highly recommend people checking out and so tell me what is your inspiration behind your topic choices i mean it was probably different in the beginning than it is now but i'd, I'd love to have some insight into that well let's go all the way back to the beginning so at the very very beginning uh my inspiration was my co-workers i, I used to work in a genetics lab uh, doing statistics for my coworkers. They were all uh, what we call wet bench researchers, meaning they do experiments that involve wet things <laughs> as opposed to dry things. A computer is a dry thing, but like they're like they're like measuring small volumes of of liquids and from one tube and squeezing them into other tubes. Uh, mm -hmm. So they they uh, so they did all these experiments and they had me doing the statistics. And it's an academic lab, and that means there's new people coming and going basically every six months, uh, sometimes even shorter periods than that. And I would do the I would do the statistics, but I I didn't want them to think what I was doing was magic. And so what I did is um, I started these little like it wasn't really a seminar series, but I started we had a lab meeting every Friday, and part of that lab meeting I would do a little stat chat and. <laughs> you know, like stats corner or something like that. And I try to teach my coworkers the statistics uh, uh, that I was using on their research. So it was real obvious, you know, like what to talk about, because it was like, they'd say, hey, Starmer, can you do a T-test? And I'm like, yes, I can. And I can teach you about it. And, and so, uh, and so I do those little things. And, but, you know, like I said, I'm in, it's an academic lab and every six months there's new people. And I was like, you know, I could repeat myself every six months for the rest of my life, or I could just record a, a YouTube video and put it online. And then like when someone in the lab needs to learn about R squared, they just go to the, go to the link and they learn about R squared. And it's the same presentation I would have given anyways. Uh, and so if you watch the early videos, they're all about mice. Uh, Cause it was a mouse genetics lab. And so all I do is talk about mice <laughs> and like things you can do with mice. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, to be honest, uh, when I was starting out, I didn't, I wasn't, ex I mean, the channel I, I thought was going to be relatively, it, I wasn't intending for it to be private, but I just figured it was going to be private. Cause like, let's be honest back then I was like, who wants to watch a video about R squared other than someone in dire straits? Um, uh, you know, I just assumed <laughs> no one would watch that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and I remember at the time you, you think, you think members of the band are Dire Straits are really keen to know the proportion of variance. <laughs> they, yeah, uh, Mark they, Knopfler's <laughs> dying <laughs> to learn about R squared. <laughs> like, oh, finally, R squared with mice. Exactly. This is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, he texts me like five times a day. 
<laughs> it's like, when's it coming out? And uh, it drives me crazy. You know, I'm like, come on, you got to wait for it. But anyways, I, you know, I, and I'll be honest in the first year, uh, the only people that watched my stuff were people in my lap. And that was fine because that's what it, who it was for. But I will, right. I'll be honest, you know, uh, I've never, I, I'm, I'm not like some like g- Zen guru who's just like, I just want to do it for the prop. You know, I, I had the, I had some fantasies about people watching my videos and I think, wouldn't that be cool if people watched them? But I had a, a friend of mine who was like, he was starting a guitar channel and it was like blowing up. And I was like, dang, if only I was like <laughs> teaching guitar stuff. Only I can play the guitar. All I've got is this tenor guitar and no one likes listening to it. No one wants to learn how to play the tenor guitar. <laughs> Uh, and, 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 you know, so I was like, man, he's got, that's the way to do it. He's got the channel, you know, and I'm like, and I'll always just have this little tiny channel and it's fine because it spared me the agony of having to present the same material every six months. And so it, it served its purpose, but it did, you know, in the end, it kind of blew up, you know, despite my best efforts to make it sound obscure and going, well, let's weigh another mouse. And, and I've got all these business people watching it now that like, could you use some business examples instead of mice? And I'm like, well, <laughs> you, got a, you, got a, you got a mouse with a suit. Exactly. It goes to the office. A mouse goes to Wall Street. And weighs himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's how it started out. Uh, and so and it goes, anyways, my ins- uh, to go back to the original question, what's my inspiration? The inspiration for that was my coworkers. It started out that way. And then I was at a, a conference uh, once and this guy who was also at the conference and he was do- he was a chemist. And he goes, you're in statistics, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, do you know anything about random forests? And I said, no. And he said, yeah, because I just read a paper and it had a random forest and I have no idea what it means. And I said, I don't either. Uh, but for, I was like, but I'm kind of curious. And so when I came home from that conference, I researched uh, uh, random forests and random forests are made from uh, decision trees. And so I had to research decision trees. And I was like, you know, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to make a video on decision trees. And that was the start of stat quest transformation from being all stats all the time to being some stats with a lot of machine. I think I've got more machine learning videos than I have stats uh, now. And and sometimes I worry that maybe the name of the channel is, is holding me back because I think a lot of people just say, Oh, Josh Starmer's great for stats. And you got to go to this other channel for machine learning. And maybe, maybe that's true. And maybe, mm-hmm. maybe that is the best way to learn. But I, I sometimes wonder if I had been more like Data Science Quest or something like that. But anyways, it is Stat Quest. It's what it is. I've got a great name for you. It's Statsimul Quest. <laughs> it's Statsimul Quest. <laughs> yeah, I like that. When did it change from you? You jokingly called it a Stats Corner on when it was like the Friday. When did, when did it become Stats Quest? Stats Quest. Uh, stat quest yeah, yeah no and now you quest. can't say it anymore you're gonna uh, always say stats stats quest. Quest, <laughs> as it's been known for minutes <laughs> exactly <laughs> that channel uh so uh i i i i realized that there was already like like there might have already been a channel called stat chat or a website <laughs> called stat chat or something like that uh, and yeah, so yeah. i i had a vote and i had the lab vote on the on what it should be <laughs> called and we went with stat quest um, and, uh, I love it. You know, it's funny because in hindsight, my whole life has been nothing but quests. Uh, the, I was just, I'm just, I'm preparing a talk for, for McGill that I'm going to give on Friday and they want to, they want to know about my, my path. And so I was going way back to like high school. Like, what did I do in high school? Did anything I do in high school give me an indication of where I would be later in life? And it, and it, uh, it turns out that the, I taught myself how to program to build a game. And the game was called Jimmy Quest. <laughs> and the, and the, and really all I did, I mean, I had a few, like, it was like an adventure game and like you go through a door and you, you know, you find some stuff, but, but there really wasn't a whole lot to the game. The, the point of the game was to have the theme song and there was a theme song for Jimmy Quest and it went Jimmy, 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 something like that. And there, and you had a, a, a yellow bouncing ball going over all the words of Jimmy so it just never like why even follow it was a joke that uh my uh, friend of mine came up with anyway so that's uh i was like wow it goes all the way back there i've been on a quest forever <laughs> oh yeah i mean I, hopefully most people could now that you mention it hopefully especially i expect people that are listening to a data science podcast 
hopefully there's been some questing in your life. And yeah, I, I, I love that you've named them clearly. The Jimmy yeah. Quest, now the Stat Quest. Um, super cool. So then, so then today, with now there being so much machine learning on there, so you know we had the beginning with you know t tests and specific techniques that would happen a lot in your lab. Then the random forest conversation led to the random forest content, and then so now with all the recently machine learning neural networks. Um, I guess they might similarly have been things that you were like, I would love to understand that a lot better and maybe other people would too. Yeah, exactly. So uh, not, not everyone knows this about StackQuest. A lot of people, or me personally, a lot of people think that, um, that I know everything there is to know about both statistics and machine learning. And I'll be honest, I'm like one StackQuest video ahead of you. <laughs> that's, just, that's the extent of my knowledge. I mean, I've done this for a long time. So yeah, I've actually got some good depth at this point. Uh, but I taught, I did a series on neural networks because I want, I was like, how I got to figure out how these things work. And I've watched a lot of videos and I'd read a lot of blog posts and I was like, none of this makes any sense to me. Uh, and so I had to do it my own way and I had to just make a simple neural network and plug numbers in and just see what happened. And once I saw what happened, I was like, oh, I get it. You just have to have a real simple input and that gives you a real simple output and you can do the math and you can see what's happening. Uh, but, but before I made that video, I'll be honest, despite my best efforts, I only had a vague concept of what a neural network was other than like a weird, like spider web of messy things. Yeah, yeah. I wonder <laughs> how many people would be blown away. So if people have been working with regression models for like decades and they see all the incredible things neural networks are doing, it's kind of staggering that it, it's just a bunch of regression models. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, it's, uh, it's just fancy. It's like a, what is it? Uh, what do they call it? A, a weighted weighted regression model or something like that or something i don't know i remember when i was in graduate school there were these two guys in the stats department and this one guy goes have you heard about neural networks and the other guy goes yeah it's just a bunch of weighted regression or i think he might have said <laughs> weighted least squares and i was like i don't even know what any of that means oh. <laughs> but i so i've been thinking about that for like the last you know 13 years like <laughs> like I just, I just i was like how do I, how do I like not feel intimidated by those guys? Right. Because they clearly knew so much more than I would ever know in my entire life, just in that offhand conversation that they had. So I've been working on it and I finally figured it out and I was like, oh yeah, sure. You could call it that if you wanted to, but it's a yeah, little, yeah, yeah. it's a little different, uh, uh, in that it's, uh, it's got a lot more flexibility in that it's a lot easier to sort of like add more nodes and more hidden layers and things like that. Yeah. And, yeah. But with that greater flexibility comes a lot like it becomes, it's not as straightforward to like put one together and have it work correctly. Uh, whereas lint regression is such a, such a science, right? That it's so obvious as to how to assemble it. And I think that's a real advantage that regression can have over, over neural networks sometimes. The alternative data industry is expected to grow tenfold in the next five years. So, how will your skills and training stay competitive in this brave new world? Well, fortunately for us, the Alternative Data Academy has just released the world's first alternative data courses aimed at working professionals through its free and on-demand training platform. The courses are taught by some of the biggest names in the alternative data space, including the prominent New York University professor Gene Exter and renowned Oxford professor Alexander Deneff. Sharpen your alternative data skills for free today with the Alternative Data Academy. All the details are online at altdata.academy. That's altdata.academy. Was in the past decade, it was neural networks have suddenly become really relevant. Uh, not only because compute has become a lot cheaper and storage has become a lot cheaper, so we can have bigger data sets, which are two really big things that we need for neural networks, particularly deeply layered neural networks, deep learning uh, approaches to work effectively. But the, the third piece alongside the cheaper compute and the bigger data sets is that in the last 10, 15 years, people have come up with ways of more reliably training neural networks. 
Um, and that's that's been a big, a big yeah. A big they, they got rid of the sigmoid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was the big thing. That was the big turning point. Get rid of the sigmoid and use the ReLU uh, activation function from now on. Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, there's variations on that theme, but I think the sigmoid was a major inhibitor of neural network progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that for people who aren't aware of it, so these these words, sigmoid, ReLU, they are functions that we apply to basically the result of a regression at each of these little neural network nodes within uh, a broader system of these neurons. And uh, that's another really powerful thing that does differentiate the approach significantly from regression or linear regression is that it, it then allows you to have non-linear relationships. So you can have uh, regression models, I think almost always at their core, there's gonna be a linear relationship. Like you can have a polynomial input, but, uh, but so neural networks can automatically handle nonlinear relationships between inputs and outputs and interaction terms. And so it means that, and there's a really great chapter four of Michael Nielsen's free online book called Neural Networks and Deep Learning, uh, has these little um, JavaScript applets that you can play around with in your browser that proves to you that by having these nonlinearities allowed by a sigmoid or a ReLU function, it allows you to approximate any continuous relationship between an input and an output. So it's part of why neural networks are so powerful. Yes. The other thing that's kind of uh, cool about neural networks is um, they don't need a whole lot of data. Like for general linear regression, right? Yeah, you need more data than you have parameters. Uh, neural networks, you can actually have less data uh, than you have parameters and you can still fit it. It's right. crazy, right? How is that? How's that possible? But it works. Yeah, it's true. It does. It boggles the traditional statistician's mind to think <laughs> that you're like, let's have a model with a billion parameters and 10,000 training data points. You're like, that's never going to work. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And yet somehow, yeah, it's a super, super powerful, cool technique. I, I mean, yeah, I could... I don't, I don't know if you know this about me, but it's it's deep learning and kind of teaching deep learning that got me started in communicating data science to people. Uh, so that's, yeah. So I, I could go on about this forever, but uh, this is, episode is about you. Uh, so, um, so what's your process? Do you have a particular process for learning content? Um, I know from videos of yours that I've seen that you you generally, you're trying to identify general principles as opposed to memorizing things, memorizing equations. So you actually, I can't remember what all of the examples were, but you showed in a video that I watched recently, you showed several different equations where the concept was the same because in the numerator we had explained variance and in the denominator was the total variance. And you had three very different looking equations used in different statistical approaches that all really meant the same thing. So is that is that a key part of your process to learning? What other tricks do you have up your sleeve? <laughs> yeah, I, I do try to. My dad, you know, he, you know, ever since I was a little kid, he was always like, you got to focus on the main ideas. And uh, and so just my whole life, doesn't matter what I'm doing. I've always like thought I better focus on the main ideas. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, I just hear that voice in my head, and um, and that's what I try to do. So, uh, and, and as opposed to kind of getting lost in sort of, you know, like you know the what do they call the bells and whistles? You know, it's it's easy to get excited about bells and whistles, uh, and get and get overwhelmed by them. Like, uh, you know, like I, I sometimes use like a car uh, as a as an example of like lots of bells and whistles. When you watch a, a television commercial about cars they're going to talk about bells and whistles as if they're the most important things ever. And to be honest, you know, they'd be like, this has got something cool feature. Like it's got a rear view window. It's got a, you know, or what else are they going to say? AFF, AM, AM, FM cassette, <laughs> you know, or something, yeah. you know, they're going to try to impress. Heated, heated, heated pad behind your head. Heated headrest. Yeah. He's, he's going to say, headrest. he's yeah. going to say, this has got a manual transmission. It's, you know, all these things or whatever. <laughs> They're going to try to like blow your mind with like all these 
fancy, Extra fancy schmancy. manual. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's got a parking brake. And and you're just like, wow, you know, all these bells and whistles are so cool. I'm going to go buy this car. Well, that's fundamentally, if you're a smart car buyer, you're going to you're going to think about, like, is the engine reliable? What's the gas mileage? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, does how it expensive our repairs? How expensive are repairs? Uh, they, they, those are the main ideas. Those are the main concepts of the gun and the, and the bells and whistles are, are just marketing ploys. Um, yeah. and so I, I try to, I try to like look past all those and I'll be honest, it's easy because everyone talks about the bells and whistles with, especially with machine learning, you hear all like, like in that, that hallway conversation or like you hear about neural networks, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, I don't know what they were saying, but it didn't make any sense to me at all. But it wasn't also, I mean, it was like. You know, just everyone's talking about the latest, greatest. And in, in machine learning, especially, there's always the latest, greatest. There's a new method coming out for neural networks every other week. You know, mm -hmm. how many of those have long-term lasting value? I, I, I'd say only a small percentage of them. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a real important to try to like sort the signal from the noise and the noise being sort of all the the latest trends in data science and not to say that they're the trends are not important. Uh, the trends are important, but, but fundamentally we need to focus, at least from my perspective, I like to focus on the main ideas, um, of how things work so that I can either see how they're related to other things that I already know. Um, like seeing the relationship between neural networks and regression or, uh, um, or seeing how things are different and going, oh, this is actually a fundamentally different process. And it's and and that's actually very useful to know because when one method works, I don't necessarily want to want to use a slight, you know, a, a method that's like highly relate, highly correlated with that first method. I want to use like something that's orthogonal and it's going to be completely different uh, and try that uh, as a way to but to maybe that's got a better chance of working or, or, or just, uh, validating that the results from this are, are consistently reproducible. Um, and so it's nice to know sort of what's similar and what's different. And that's, and I find those, the answers to those questions are given to me from the main ideas. Cool. I love it. So it is like a specific example when somebody says random force to you or neural network to you and you're like, Oh, I don't know anything about that. Yeah. You just start with like a Google search. Or... I do. Yeah. The step one, yeah. Google search. Uh, <laughs> and I just, and then I just click on every single thing I see. Uh, uh, although at least I, I used to, I don't do that anymore. I'm a little more judicious, uh, but I used to breed everything. Um, and, but now and you're got, just like, Oh, I should see, I should go watch the stack quest video. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd make it a lot I mean, easier. I, I'm kind of, I'm digressing now, but does that happen that you, you know, you've made so many videos now over so many years that sometimes you come across something and you're like, Oh, you know, I made a video on that four years ago and I don't really remember anymore. And you actually watch your own video to remember. Does that ever happen? I do watch my own videos to remember all the time because I, well, partly because people are always asking me questions about them and I can't remember the right. details. They'll be right. like, right, right. wait a minute, what's Lambda? And I'm like, what? <laughs> I made that yeah, video that three actually, years ago. <laughs> that is something. So if you're listening, listener, and I guess you are listening. <laughs> so since you're listening, listener, um, when you ask a question of a YouTube video, please put a timestamp in because I, I'm i sure this happens to you at orders of magnitude more than, than me. And it definitely happens to you orders of magnitude more than, than me uh, because there'd be this normal distribution of how much people are commenting on your videos. And then you take how many I get and then you multiply it by a thousand and that gives you how many comments you're getting on your videos. And so when you get these comments, so you're watching the video, there's something that doesn't make sense to you or you have a question about, and so you just ask the question. But some of these videos are long. They're like 20 minutes long. And it might have been made years ago. And so I have no idea what you're talking about. And I can't take the time to watch all of the video to figure to try to guess where you were when you had that question. So if you put a timestamp when you ask a question, that would be super helpful. That's a bam. You put the timestamp, I say bam. <laughs> bam. Yeah. Oh, it's we got a, one. Yeah, it's a lifesaver. Um, but yeah, so yeah, people ask uh, real specific questions about things I haven't thought of in a long time. And 
that's okay. <laughs> right. And so anyway, so I, I, I dig, I've taken you now several steps away from where we were on the intended course of conversation. So going back from uh, answering questions. Yeah, I mean, just, yeah, like, how do you, um, like, how, not even how do you make the videos, which actually is my next question, but how, how you learn. Like, so you, you go into Google, you click on everything on the first page about random forest, and then... Then I do it on the second page and the third page, and I have, like, 30 tabs <laughs> open. And, <laughs> and I read everything I, I, I can, and uh, very little of it will make sense at all. It's usually, I'm not very good with equations. I'm not really good with uh, Greek mathematical symbols. A lot of them scare me. Uh, and so I kind of glaze over when I see that stuff and I go, come on, someone's got to have something else. Uh, and I just go page to page and I'll pick up a little bit of lingo, you know, while I'm doing that, I'll start seeing terms that pop up a lot, you know, like mm -hmm. when I was researching neural networks, people start saying, wait, people start saying bias. They start saying that a lot and, and they are activation function. And so little, like just by. I, it's like I it's like my brain is is building a histogram of terms that it frequently sees in association with this topic. And that'll give mm -hmm. me uh, and I'll go, OK, well, what's a excuse me, what's a what's an activation uh, function? And so I'll, I'll dive into that. And so then it'll be another thing. OK. You know, so lots and lots of reading and reading and reading and reading. And then I just go back. To, and once I once I've got to the bottom of that or I, I, I can't go any further because I'm going to go crazy because <laughs> you can never hit the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. it's like that hole. You're just like, ah, and you're falling forever. Uh, and that's the way the internet is sometimes. Uh, but anyways, so what I'll do is I'll go back to the, to, to the top of that very first search and I'll go through everything again and I'll reread it and I'll go, Hey, okay. Now I know a little bit more about activation functions. This thing I read now makes a lot more sense. Or I'll say, Oh, I've seen this equation, but I saw it. Someone else broke it into smaller pieces. And so I understood this one piece. And so now when I see the whole thing, maybe it makes a little more sense and it's an iterative process. And once I've got like a, a very basic, very fundamental rudimentary understanding of what's going on, my next goal is to make the simplest example, like the hello world of whatever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. I make a very simple neural network. I make a very simple support vector machine, anything, I, whatever it is, I try to make it as simple as possible. And then I just plug numbers in and I do the math by hand. Uh, those big scary right. equations with all the Greek, they're scary, but they're just, they're just like those things I had to do in high school. You just plug in a number and then you got to multiply it by E and raise it to some exponent. And then you've got to like divide it by something else. I just do the math. Uh, and, and as scary as it is, it's still just a little like warm, fuzzy equation. That's not, you know, you, as long as you plug in the numbers, it's, you're going to get something as output. And, and that helps me a lot. It, it takes a lot of the fear and the anxiety that I usually associate with seeing a complicated mathematical formula. And I go, I just got to do it. And once I do it, I, I draw, I draw the output, I draw relative to the input and I start seeing what's happening. And that's a big, big help for me. And then I also, if there's like an implementation, I'll, I'll drop in my little simple data set and I'll see if I get what I expect. And I never do. I always get something different. And that's, <laughs> that's where the learning, that's where the re learning really happens. You know, I start, well, why didn't mm -hmm. I get what I expected? I have to answer those questions. And it's, it's, to me, it's very exciting and, and it's, it's, it's scary. It starts off very scary. And, and it's funny cause it's that I, you'd think after doing this for years, I'd, I'd be less scared and intimidated, but I'm always scared and intimidated because those first <laughs> sometimes weeks, I feel like I'm getting nothing done. I'm like, I'm never going to understand this. And I, I freak out. Uh, but I, off, I, I always do. And you'd think I'd learn that. Don't worry, Starmer, you're going to figure it out. But I always freak out. I'm like, I'm never going to figure it out. <laughs> but, uh, but I do. And, but it's, that's the process and it's, it's very iterative and it's, and it's staged. So you start with reading everything and then you start with trying to like do the math and then you do an implementation and I've, once I've done all three of those things and, and everything's lining up, you know, the implementation, yeah. my little doing the math, what I've read, everything is, is like, oh yeah, this is all consistent. Then it's time to start making the video. Awesome. So you've gone through your, your weeks of trials and tribulations, your, your little mini quest, your random forest quest. I'm in the random forest and I can't find the sword. Um, 
Jimmy, where'd you go? You lost. Um, I know you must be around here somewhere. Um, so, so you go through the, the reading stage, the math stage, the implementation stage. Now it's time to create the video. And I know from another video of yours that, so you had, this is another thing that your dad imparted on you is that there's always a better way. So that photo of the turtles and the one on the upside down turtle shell rowing. Um, so there's, there's always a better way to do things. And so do you end up, I mean, I guess you're about to tell me, but I'm kind of guessing here. There's kind of some, in addition to the iterative process of learning, there's probably an iterative process of creating. So from the dozens of places that you'd learn something, probably some of those stuck, you were like, oh, yeah, that was a kind of cool visual way of doing it. But actually, if it had a bit from that other video, from that other blog post, it'd be even a little better. And then all, all of a sudden, you're, bam, you've got a new way of doing it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the way I do it is when I'm researching, you know, none of it makes any sense to me at all. And I, but I ask the question, why? Why does it not make any sense? What's missing? Mm. What are they not saying? What parts are they, have they omitted that prevent me from just instantly grasping this concept? So I, I ask myself those questions and that's what I try to, I tr I tr you know, the answer to those questions of what's missing is what I try to provide with my video. And one thing I like about that strategy is it means I'm not copying anybody. You know, it's, this is, this is an original perspective. And what I like about that is, um, you know, like, I mean, in the, the internet is in some ways a big echo chamber. Like someone comes up with something, someone says, here's, this is how support vector machines works. And then someone else will, will put a, an article on their blog or whatever. That's, basically exact same thing. And sometimes they even use the same pictures and everything. And, and if, and if blog number one did not help me, I'll guarantee you blog number two is not going to help me either. Cause they're kind of saying the same thing. And so, and that, and that may reach some people, some people may read that and go, I get it. Okay. But I didn't get it when I read it. I didn't it, get it. Often when I come across that, I'm even like, I don't, I'm not convinced that the author of the post gets what's going on here. <laughs> that's true yeah because they're just kind of copying somebody else yeah you're like yeah what anyways explain it in your own words Good yeah luck. exactly yeah exactly so anyways uh so what i'm thinking when i see that i go well that, that might speak to somebody but it doesn't speak to me uh and so what i want to be what i want my video to be is to is to be when people read that blog and they go i didn't make any sense i want them to have a place they can go that says it differently and, and fills in all the blanks that that first person left out so that, so that they'll go, okay, well, maybe it wasn't the first thing I looked, but the second thing, that Sackwest video, I, that's, that got, that got the, the things, you know, and I was able to understand it that way. So I, I try to focus on what they're not saying and, and the things that would, would have helped me understand it to begin with. So I guess it's a lot of focus on me, uh, but it's part, and it's my quest. I'm trying to learn new and exciting things. Mm -hmm. And, and so I keep track of, of of what didn't make sense and what they didn't say and what maybe if they'd said it, it would have been, I, uh, maybe I would have gotten it. And, you know, to be honest, if, if I, when I do read up on a topic that I think is like super crystal clear, it's hard, it's super hard for me. And I, I don't even want to make a stat quest on that. All I want to do is just say, Hey, just check out this other website. Cause they do a much better job. Um, and I felt, you know, and sometimes, um, Sometimes I'm wrong about that. Sometimes I'm right. Sometimes I'm wrong. But 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 if 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 I find something that's like great to begin with, um, like this guy uh, Jay Alamar, he has some awesome visualizations, and it's like I don't even want to make a stack quest on that. His stuff, bam, that's done. Uh, so there's just some great stuff out there, and and I don't I don't want to like overlap them with my own. I don't need to do that. And it's a, and it's making a stack quest takes an incredible amount of time. Uh, I so, bet. So I'd rather not have to do that. So when I find something that's good, I'm like, okay, that's done. I don't have to do it. I can move on to another topic. Yeah, it, it's clear that you put a huge amount of time into your videos. So when you, so when you come up with the visualizations, kind of the general flow of what you'd like to do, then it seems like you script it. I mean, you definitely do because you should, you put the text on the screen. So you script it, and so you, maybe you have like you know some kind of word processor file with like the sketches of what you want to have and the text that will accompany it. And then you convert that into a slide format, I guess. You're, are you just using slides? Yeah, I, I do everything in Keynote. 
um, I, I'd love Keynote. Um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> I wish I wish yeah. Apple would give me like a direct connection to some of their developers. I've got some <laughs> ideas. If, if any of them are listening, I've got some great ideas. Uh, but I love Keynote. It's just, you know, I'll be honest. Uh, I just use the default settings on everything and it, everything looks great. It actually, it, you totally do. I see that now. Yeah. Uh, defaults on everything keynote and i do it all in keynote and i just love it and and i, I highly recommend it so if you want to you want to make something that looks just like mine it's super easy just do it in keynote and with the default <laughs> settings and it'll look just like a stack quest um but uh but I, yeah i do it i outline it and iterative it, there's that's a very iterative procedure as well where usually what i do is i take you know like i said during the research phase i do the math and if I think doing the math is going to be helpful for other people, if it helped me, then I'll include the math. And that little mm -hmm. like I try, you know, remember that the simplest example I can possibly come up with, uh, that's always key. So a lot of that research funnels straight into the, the video and a lot of the research I do on within Keynote. I just I just open up a blank Keynote thing and I just start typing in random thoughts and I'll and I'll draw out what I think is, is a, a simple example and I'll test it out and. And I, the whole well, for so for me, it's all like I just keynote is there from the very beginning uh, all the way to the very end. Awesome. And then so the illustrations themselves are also made in keynote. Yeah, everything's done Ooh. in keynote. Uh, very rarely oh. I've had to do like occasionally I have to do three dimensional graphs like in my gradient descent video. Uh, I had to draw a three dimensional surface or something like that. And I'm like, ah, I can't do that in keynote. But uh, uh, almost, you know, 99% of the time I do everything. In fact, uh, I, I feel like I'm going to steal a punchline to it to maybe later on in the, in the thing, but I actually wrote a book in keynote. I wrote a, uh, a, a over 300 what? page book in keynote. <laughs> what somehow even in researching for this episode, I didn't know you wrote a book. Has it not come out yet? Cause one person on Twitter, when I said I was interviewing you wrote, I'm waiting for his book. Yeah, it's it comes out this spring. It's called the StatQuest oh. Illustrated Guide to Machine Learning. It's coming out oh, coming out in a few months. Cool. Uh, but it was written in Keynote with all default settings. Very cool. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to check that out. And neither can that Twitter user, and I'm sure countless other so so how did how did that person on Twitter know that you're making this? You've talked about it before? Uh, yeah, I've tweeted about it. I mean, especially on Twitter. I've t I, t I, I, right. I post about things like that on Twitter and I and on LinkedIn. Um, uh, it's something I'm pretty excited about. Um, as people have been asking me to do a book for a long time, and and like likewise, I, I always like, why would you want a book? We got the introduction of statistical learning and R. I love that book. Uh, but uh, but over time, I realized that. Um, that we did need a book. There was a lot of things not being said. And, the, and, and I can also, you know, when I say I wrote a book in, in, in keynote, it's actually, I drew a book. It's all pictures. I mean, there's a little, <laughs> little bit of text, but I drew a yeah. book and it's, and it's over 300 pages of like me drawing a picture for it's, it's like a, a comic book. It took forever, wow. um, but there's, I don't think there's I anything bet. else like it. Yeah, that does sound unique. I so my book is called Deep Learning Illustrated. Mm. And oh, wow. yeah, and so there are a lot of illustrations. So I worked with I'm fortunate to have a friend who is an extremely talented artist. She's actually like like she's she is a fine artist. So like her making illustrations for a deep learning book was like really taking a step down for her. And when you see like when she does like a gallery opening, it doesn't mention my book ever. <laughs> Um, but, but we, but it's still, it's like, it's not, it's not like the book you're describing. It is, it's still, it's a, it's a textbook. It has, uh, it has, I did it in LaTeX. So, you know, it has LaTeX for the, for the typesetting of the language. And then I insert an illustration, uh, and I insert code. And so it flows very much like a normal book. We focused on visual explanations wherever we could. And there is something like, so it's, uh, it's something like a 500 page book, I think. And there's something like 200 illustrations. So there's like a lot of illustrations, but I have had some super scathing Amazon reviews that are like, 
this is an illustrated. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I think what they're looking for is what you've described, where like it's really like every page is like, you know, it, it's, an, it's an illustration per page and the text is like explaining the illustration. It's like really, it really is, yeah, like that. It's, it's illustration first. Yeah, it's, it's, it is, it is an illustrated guide. It is, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> You could take the words out. You could take all the words out and you could probably still read the book and it would probably make a little bit of sense. Awesome. Yeah. I, I just remembered one very specifically, which was like, would have given this a five star review, but it's not illustrated. So giving two. <laughs> hey, like, what? Ouch. <laughs> Come on. Ouch. Um, anyway. Uh, so, all right. So the book's coming out. That's something that I didn't even know. That's super exciting. Uh, in addition to that, so in addition to the StatQuest channel, in addition to the forthcoming book, you are also the lead AI educator at a firm called Grid AI or Grid.ai. Yeah, Grid, Grid.ai um, or just Grid. I'm actually there's one, there's two, there's or there's two two lead AI educators. Uh, uh, the other <laughs> one is yeah, we're two leads, but the other one is Sebastian. I, I yeah, Rashki. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, we were just hanging out. We just last we just spent last week in Milan together, sort of planning how <laughs> our, our making our plan of attack and how we can collaborate and sort of like we do different things, but there's going to be some intersection, um, which is pretty cool because he is like you know he is a wizard at uh, sort of like the nuances of like actually implementing a, a, a neural network and making it be awesome. And I'm more of like, well, I read about neural networks. And so, you know, what else is there to do? <laughs> you know, he actually knows those nuts and bolts. And so we're thinking of coming up with some great collaborations between the two of us where we combine my sort of like big picture and sort of make sure you understand the main ideas with his sort of like, and let's actually get this to work uh, attitude. Um, and so I think we got some cool stuff coming up. It's a yeah, I don't know what you want to ask about Grid, but uh, so far it's been awesome. I love what they do. They're what is it? Okay. Would be so, a good one. <laughs> yeah, so Grid, um, Grid's a couple of things. Two dimensions, and uh, you get vertical lines and some horizontal lines. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, so it's hard. Let me, let me explain. So I don't know if you've ever tried to do anything in the cloud. Uh, I'm always... I'm Sure. I'm intimidated by the cloud in terms of, like, layers of, like overhead and tedium and things like that of like you got to log into a node you got to configure the node you got to like get your stuff on the node you gotta maybe how many <laughs> nodes do you need you don't even know you know it's like i don't know the cloud and the cloud yeah. scares me with all these implementation details uh and grid say like you've written a, a program in python and you're like i ran it on my laptop and it works great let's run on the cloud now all you got to do is add one word to your command line that precedes python and boom it's on the cloud wow yeah that's what i'm talking about that's my kind of cool. thing <laughs> I, I, I mean some people love that kind of stuff I, I i'm not a big fan of all that stuff i i like i like just i just want to run my program on the cloud and not have to worry about like all those details and grid takes care of it uh and that's super awesome grid also they also support something called pytorch lightning um yeah which is yeah, yeah, yeah. um which is a sort of a, a layer on top of PyTorch that again, what it does is it, uh, it, all those technical details of like this, I want to run this on this GPU and I run this somewhere else, blah, blah, blah. All these little technical mm -hmm. details, PyTorch mm -hmm. lightning takes care of that. And you don't have to worry about it. You just mm -hmm. worry about making the best neural network you can without having to worry about like, I don't know, any technical details. And so I'd love, I love that they're basically making everything, something that I would want to do <laughs> as opposed to just right, look at it right. and go, you know, because I'll be honest, I don't have a whole lot of time. I mean, I spend so much time on my stack quest. I don't have a whole lot of time to be like dinking around with uh, getting stuff running on the cloud. But I, but I think it's important. I, I, it's something I want to do because I, yeah. uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious about it. Cause I, I hate to be that guy. That's like, well, I can talk about it, but I can't do it. I don't want to be that guy. Uh, I want to be the guy that like actually can do it. And so grid is sort of like saving me, uh, by, by making it a lot simpler uh, to do that. And I just, I mean, um, I love, I mean, I gotta be honest. I love that. It's a company that values me for what I do. They're like, 
we want to make this product something that anyone can use, you know, and that's why we, we're bringing on Josh Starmer. <laughs> that's because why we're, if Josh can use it, anyone can use it. <laughs> yeah. And if he can, and, and he he should be able to explain it to people. I think it's a great product. Right. And what I love about it is, um, it, it, it takes, it takes all the, the, um, what is it? Sort of the overhead of like expertise, uh, for cloud computing and infrastructures and all that. And it makes it go away. And it means anyone, anywhere, they could watch a stat quest video and, and then go, Oh, I want to try that too. And then they, without having to like, then spend the next four months reading about how to do it on the cloud, they can just start doing it on the cloud from anywhere. So even if they've got the crummiest laptop ever, you know, they've got this, they're, they're, you know, it's a hand me down from their grandfather, you know, <laughs> And they're not going to be able to run anything locally. They can do it. They can still do real uh, like industrial grade machine learning anywhere in the world with anything, right? You know, it doesn't matter. You don't, the hardware you bring to the party doesn't matter. Uh, and I, I love that because uh, a lot of my audience is all over the world. Um, some places are like super rich countries right. and may, yeah, sure. They probably have relatively easy access to fancy computation, uh, computational tools and fancy computers, but other places it's like, it's like, totally. uh, they, they may not have e as easy access to the state of the art that other people do. And I love that, like grid is making it so that it's, you know, you don't have to be super rich. You don't have to be living in a rich country. You can have access to all this stuff anywhere in the world, no matter what. And I love that too. And the other thing, I hate to like keep talking about how much I like grid, but the last thing is, is they're actually coming up with a way to uh, because like like on these new Apple laptops, like those processors are so like discreet and yet powerful at the same time that they're mm -hmm. trying to come up with a way that people can donate processing power uh, to anyone like, you know, pre presumably this is going to be, uh, you know, people that that need it to be donated to them. But but you could donate computing power to anyone for free. And so. So then people could come in from any background, any, any situation and go, okay, I, I, <clears throat> I want to learn about machine learning. I want to do machine learning. I want to do it in the cloud. Uh, but I don't really have, I've got this crummy, you know, grandfather hand me down computer and I don't have much money for cloud, you know, compute time. Well, they're figuring out a way to give away for free, uh, cloud compute time. And I think it's amazing, you know, so, uh, that I'm, is awesome. I'm a big fan. I hope they find a way to prevent people from mining Bitcoin with that free compute. Yeah, that's true. I, I'm right there with you. That that's kind of like an abuse of 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 all kinds of things. It's it's kind of frustrating. Oh, super frustrating. Unbelievable. Um, all right. That sounds super cool. And yeah, you are doing a brilliant job of explaining how cool grid is. I love that. Also, if you if you, Josh, or anybody listening, ever knows how I can get Will Falcone, the creator of PyTorch Lightning, on this show. Oh, Man, I'd yeah, love sure. that in on the program. I'll see oh. what I can do. I, I will, I'll, 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 one more pitch. Wow. Uh, Grid is hiring. Uh, uh, oh, so yeah, if yeah, yeah. anyone listening to this is like, hey, I want a job, uh, go ahead and apply. That'd be great. Uh, they're, they're trying to grow. It's, it's a startup. You know, it's relative. I think there's like 50 people right now. Uh, awesome people. Uh, I just, like I said, I just spent a week in Milan with these people that are just uh, it's all distributed. So we were in Milan sort of as like a pop-up office for a, for a, a brief amount of time because there was just stuff we could do together. But the company itself is 100% remote. So it doesn't matter where you are. Uh, there's people in Croatia, Switzerland, France, uh, Mexico. Uh, obviously, I'm in the United States. Uh, you name it. There's there's people in India or working for Grid, anywhere in the world. These people are working for Grid. There's about 50 of us now. They're trying to expand as quickly as they can. So go ahead. If you think you've got some skills, uh, please apply. But yeah, I, I'd love to get awesome. Will on the show. It'd be awesome. Uh, he can, he is, he's, he's a great speaker. He's, yeah. I know. I know. He's, he's not like top of my list. Um, and so for, for those, uh, job openings, do you, do you have any, uh, specific titles that you know of that are, that are currently open, uh, that people could be applying to or, uh, I mean, I think they're looking for uh, engineers, uh, all kinds of engineers. They're looking for uh, uh, technical writers. So even if you're not like super, oh, super nerdy uh, cool. and they want like they don't want just like uh, <laughs> they don't just want like super technical technical writers. They they want people 
like English majors and philosophy majors, people that know how to communicate clearly, know how to speak in active voice, uh, that kind of thing. They're, they're interested in a, in a wide variety. So even if you're like, you maybe you don't think your background is in tech, um, and I don't know why you're listening to this uh, podcast, but, <laughs> but <laughs> for the musical tips, <laughs> yeah, exactly, because you're curious about tenor <laughs> guitars. But you know, maybe you know someone who's like an English major and is out of work or something like that. You can say, "Hey, like, uh, you apply for a job at Grid." I mean, because they 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 want the best at 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 all kinds of things. And I and I re I love you know as someone who is an avid reader of documentation, I love that they're putting a premium on the quality of the documentation they want to create. They're willing to like hire people outside of the box uh, just to like, you know, make it so that, you know, you go to the documentation page and you're like, I get it. I don't, you know, plus there's going to be a stack quest there to help you along too. So it's like a double, nice. uh, double support. I, I want their documentation to rhyme. That would be great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We'll get some poets. Um, so awesome. Yeah. I, uh, it sounds like an amazing place to work. It sounds like they're doing incredible things and it would be great to be able to work alongside people like you and Sebastian. Uh, sounds like an amazing opportunity. So what, what kinds of, uh, what kinds of tools do you use either at grid or just, you know, so, you know, you've kind of talked about when you're learning a concept, you will do things by hand, but then, you know, yeah. So uh, well, programming languages. My uh, so I when I when I was working in a research lab, I, I did everything in R for a long I knew time. It. Yeah. So I'm an R guy. Uh, so what I like about okay, I do a lot in Python too. Don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't don't send me hate mail. You you <laughs> better not you better not sigh too hard on this, yeah. on this one. So what I like about and, and one, th one thing I like about R is that it's super lightweight when all you want to do is is do a little bit of math and draw a graph. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, yeah. by the time in Python, by the time you're done importing all your modules, I've already finished and I've got my, I got my graph. It's super fast for stuff like that. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I do a lot of little prototyping in, uh, in R. Um, but I'm also, um, I, I, I'm a big fan of Jupyter notebooks. I like prototyping uh, in Jupyter as well. You can, but you could do that. So that could be R or Python. Yeah, right. you can do it either way, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. I'm I l l lately I've been doing it in Python uh, because I work for a company that creates Python stuff. <laughs> but but, uh, but it's uh, you know you know I just I, I, I those are my two languages right now that I prototype in, um, and prototype is what I do. I'm, I'm hoping with Grid to get a little more serious, and with Sebastian to learn how to get a little more serious, but. Um, uh, but that's, uh, those are my, those are my two tools of choice, uh, that I go to. I, I, if it's super quick and dirty, I always go to R that's sort of my, like my native language, you know? So it's just it, by default, that's yeah, what's yeah, there. Yeah. Yep. I completely understand that. And having also come from doing a PhD focused on genetics, you know, applying statistics and machine learning. Um, we also, we, uh, one of the chapters of my PhD and we all, and actually a spin out, uh, a, a startup that came out of my research, uh, we were doing everything at that time in MATLAB. So I was mostly R and a bit of MATLAB, but yeah, more and more, yeah, for making code that needs to go into production systems. I know that there are ways to do it in R and actually we have a really great episode on that. Um, it was episode number 491. Um, with Virle van Leemput, who has a Dutch name that I always mispronounce. And so apologies to Virle. And again, I'm sure I just did it again. Um, but uh, really great episode on uh, deploying R into production. So it can be done, <clears throat> but relatively rare. You can do cool stuff in R. Um, there's just demand for both languages. And to be honest, I, 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 like, I like being able to do both. You know, it makes me feel cool. <laughs> Yep. 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 I, I, I think there's a huge amount of value in, in knowing both as a data scientist today. I mean, why not? It's the same as like the, the TensorFlow versus PyTorch argument. It's like, once you know one, it's pretty easy to know the other. You might as well just spend a little bit of time on it. Cool. So now we know what tools you're using today. Are there any 
tools or maybe even statistical or machine learning approaches that you're excited about for the future? Maybe something that overcomes some limitation that we have today? Oh, I don't know. Um, the future. That's a tough question. That is a tough question. <laughs> to be honest, obviously. Predict the future. Yeah. What's the future? Yeah. Well, <laughs> something that makes it a little especially hard for me is I'm I'm almost always looking at the past. Uh, you right. know, uh, the making my videos takes so much time uh, that I kind of like to wait for things to kind of like, you know, <laughs> stuff is invented and research is going on and then something will come up and it'll settle down and, and it'll last longer than six months or a year. And I usually wait for those little nuggets to sort of percolate from the, the noise of research. And so oftentimes I find myself looking backwards rather than than forwards. Um, and so, yeah, in terms of like, what do you predict are they going to be the great trends? I'd be like, maybe one day Python will get a good implementation of a random forest. But right now, it doesn't. <laughs> that's I dream about that. I wait. That's like that's like one of the things that makes me go back to R is R has an amazing implementation of random forest. And I actually like random forest for uh, reasons uh, that you cannot actually use in Python. Uh, random forest uh, can be used for clustering. And what's cool about using a random forest to cluster your data is you can throw any kind of data you want at it. It can be uh, discrete. It can be it can be categorical. It can be rankings. It can be uh, continuous. You can take any type of crazy data, throw it into a random forest, and use it as a clustering algorithm. Uh, and then, and not many people know that. Partly, probably because the Python implementation does not allow for that to be done but in r you can do it and it's just like it's amazing it's an amazing tool that like i don't know many other clustering algorithms that are so agnostic to the type of data that they're given and so it's it's like one of the it's one of the most powerful clustering algorithms out there actually uh that nobody uses because there's no good python implementation so that's my that's if i could fantasize of like one thing that could happen in the future that'd be like a good random forest implementation in Python would be nice. Yeah, there's a cool open source project for somebody out there to uh, to implement. That sounds awesome. So just check out how they're doing it in R and then figure out how to write it in Python. Algorithm is actually, the guy who invented it, he's got the algorithm all on his website one mm -hmm. step at a time. It's super, he's actually written a very good uh, documentation of how it works and how it can be used. And you can watch the stack quest and then bam do it sounds amazing all right so here's a question for you um we have heard a lot about your stat quest journey we got a glimpse of how it started as stat chat <laughs> back when you were an academic so you were an academic for quite a while you did it looks like two bachelor's degrees uh one in computer science one in music, uh, and then you did a PhD in computational biology or biomathematics. And then for 13 years after that, you were either a postdoc or then a assistant professor at an imminent research institution, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And so why change? So. You know, you're making StackQuest videos. You probably could have stayed an assistant professor and keep making StackQuest videos. Um, but yeah, now you're in, in the last couple of years, you've gone off to do something else. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I, I, I had the very good, good, good fortune outside of graduate school to get a postdoc in an amazing lab with amazing people, with an amazing he lab head. We call him principal investigator, PI. Uh, Terry Magnuson, he was just oh, a yeah. phenomenal uh, mentor for me, both as like a science guy because he did amazing stuff, uh, but also it's just like on a personal level, he has been incredibly influential. Um, and he is actually the reason why I left. Uh, so I did my postdoc there and he's like, Josh, if you want to stick around, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, in fact, blah, 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 give you a raise and blah, 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 and all this stuff, nice stuff. So I stuck around and and I... And I, you know, I loved, I loved working in the lab. I loved what I really loved is helping people who needed help with statistics. I loved that some of the research was 
basic, super basic research. I love because it's like super fundamental. It's like, how does the DNA even work? Right. But it was but some of the research was very like what they call translational. So there was stuff being done in the clinic as well. So I could actually see the results of the research research leading to helping people actually, you know, not just in the future of like, here's some interesting knowledge, but actually like these people are living healthier, happier lives because of some of the research that I participated in. So that was super cool. And the people themselves were super cool. Uh, to work with, but I'll be honest, my heart was not into the actual research myself. You know, I, I loved helping people with their research, and and I would, I would if 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 you know, like when we, when 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 a friend like my friend Dom, when he's writing a, a paper and I'm on there doing the statistics, uh, I will you know, and he submits it to a journal, and the reviews come back, and they're they crush it. I will go into an arena and fight like a gladiator for that research. Uh, I, I, you know, that is, that is something I'm, um, I mean, cause I, I believe in this stuff and it's not just that I'm like, I mean, I hope that makes, doesn't sound like I'm, I'm biasing myself, but, but I, I've seen the results, you know, I've seen how it works. I've been there first person. And I, and I know that if, if the reviewers don't like it, it's because we're not communicating clearly what's going on. And that's obviously clear communication is very important to me. And so I will, you know, I, I'm not just going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to just say, Hey, that reviewer is wrong. I'm going to take what they're saying as, as a failure on our behalf uh, for clearly communicating things, but I will fight and fight and fight until we've got that until we've got what they need. Um, and so, but when it comes to my own research, you know, I, I, I'd like, I came up with a clever way of like, uh, you know, when people do P PCA, you know, they're, they just do it once. And they've got no uh, error measurements. And so I was like, why don't we apply bootstrapping to PCA to get an error me measurement on, on how that's going to work instead of just taking it at face value. Um, and so I, you know, I was doing stuff like that and I tried to publish it and they were like, no, we're not interested in this. And I was like, okay, well, if, if you're not interested in then, um, um, you know, I'll, I'll do something else. You know, like I just, I don't know if it's imposter syndrome or what, but I just never really felt good if it was my own stuff. But when it was other people's stuff, I was like, oh, we need to, we need to work very hard on this. I, I just like helping people. And so, you know, toward, you know, towards the end of, you know, any, I'll be honest. So the lab used to be very, very large and I could kind of get away. I could pay my salary or not pay my salary, but earn my salary by helping everybody in the lab do what they need to do. And it was, that was a full-time job getting grad students through, getting postdocs through, getting, uh, research assistant professors, you know, doing what they needed to do. This is a big, it was a big crew and I had a lot to do, but, um, but the lab did sort of downsize and it became more critical for me to start doing my own research. And I told Terry, I said, Terry, I'm going to be honest. My heart just isn't into my own research. My heart is in helping other people's research. And he's, and, and I said, and it's also in StatQuest. <laughs> and he goes, and he goes, well, I mean, he actually said a couple of things to me. One was, you know, he said, he said his postdoc advisor gave him this advice, which is, uh, you, whatever you're doing, you have to believe it's the most important thing in the world. Right. And, and when you're on the, when you're doing research, you know, things fail all the time. And the way you get to the, those failures and you keep getting out of bed is, is you firmly believe that what you're doing is the most important thing in the world. Well, I, I modified that and I say what I believe I'm doing is the most important thing for me to be doing. I'm a, maybe a little humbler. It's the most important thing for me to be doing. And, it, and me doing my own research is not that important. The, there's tons of researchers that are probably better at it than I am, but I'm actually pretty good at StatQuest videos. And it, and it occurred to me, yeah. it occurred to me that maybe that's the most important thing that I could be doing. And and anything that gets in the way of that is actually getting in the way of me doing what I do best. And, and I need to start. So, so, you know, talking through Terry, you know, Terry eventually said, you know, I think it's time for you to go. And, and he was right. And two weeks later I left and I cried. I totally cried. <laughs> um, all right. It was such a big change. I'll be honest. I thought my whole life I was going to be a professor somewhere. And, right. and I know everyone's like, 
you're a you you're big on YouTube is that's a dream come true. But it, for me, it was like, it wasn't a dream come true. YouTube was always sort of like a side project. Uh, right. But once I got into the groove and, you know, and now I, you know, I'm, I know that this is the most important thing for me to be doing. It's I'm, I feel like I'm right where I need to be. And it's, I'm, I'm glad it all worked out the way it did. And I'm, and I'm so happy that Terry, um, you know, he just, he let it happen. He let me develop stack quest. He let it, he let me let it get big, you know, and he, and he, and he told me to go when the time was right. You know, he's like, now, you, you know, you can, you can do this. You know, he, he was supportive every step of the way and he continues to be very supportive. I, 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 I do these, uh, I, I do these drop in, you know, like stack quests every now and then for the lab. Cause, cause he requested, he's like, Hey, why don't you come back and, and give us some stack quests? And so what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll prototype, you know, like, I'll take a stat quest that is like 90% done and I'll run it through by the lab. And those guys are great because they're not mathematicians and they're not into machine learning and they're not into statistics. And so they, you know, I can just, I can look at their faces and I can see how good a job I'm doing. And, and, and as soon as they go, nice. uh, you know, they got this like, uh, look on their face. I, I go, okay, I need to work on that part and make it better. You know, it's awesome. So that's a super helpful thing that they continue to provide for me. And so it's just been They've been so supportive all through the years, but that's what happened is it was a sort of a traumatic moment at the time when I realized that my lifelong dream was over only to realize that like the reality was better than the dream. Right. right. It was, I mean, I'd never even dreamed of being on YouTube and, and yet it's better than, you know, what my dream was to begin with. So, so cool. I love that story. I love that part of your quest. Yeah, and really well told. And that's a really great message for anybody listening, probably even to me, that you should feel that whatever you're doing has to be the most important thing in the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that it is <laughs> actually the number one most important thing that anybody on the planet could be doing. That would be tough. If you can figure out what that is, you should do that. <laughs> but yeah, just that, you know, for you, for your particular skill set and interests and the impact you can make, that's somewhere in the, the center of that three circle Venn diagram of your skills, your interests, and what you can get paid to do. That's a really nice spot to be. Super cool. Um, so yeah, we've got some audience questions. I'm, I mean, I'm not out of questions because I still have, there's like listeners know that there's a couple of questions that I always ask at the end, but uh, we do have some questions from the audience. So Serge Massis, who was actually a recent guest on the show, he's an expert in interpretable machine learning and he wrote a book on it. Um, he's in episode number 539 of the show for people who want to listen to a great episode. Um, so he wrote uh, a question to you on LinkedIn. He said, human genetics are 99.9% .9 similar. I think it's even much more than that. We're super, super similar to each other genetically. I think we're like 99.9% .9 similar to a chimp. Um, he says, I have no idea how similar music is, but in the realm of all sounds perceivable to the human ear, probably extremely similar. My question for Josh is given so many high profile copyright lawsuits, can music be identified by markers that demonstrate lineage or similarity, much like it's done with genetics? So cool question, because it ties together your genetics experience and your music experience. Uh, I mean, to a certain degree, you can, I mean, in pop music, you can, you can listen to the beat and the beat is almost always derivative of a whole tree of things. Um, and, and the beat sort of like, you know, the beat is, I don't know, how do you say it? Um, you can say, oh, this is, you know, this, you know, this Justin Bieber song is like this, this beat super popular <laughs> in the Caribbean, you know, it, it was originated in the Caribbean and, you know, you know, they're the ones that sort of like pioneered it and you can, and you can kind of do that to every little thing. I used to play with this drummer. He was great. He was like a, I mean, he was like a total like PhD drummer. Because every little thing he did, he could cite. He could say, oh, I've got the snare sound <laughs> from, you know, uh, St Steve, <laughs> Steve Gadd and, on Asia. I've got the, the kick drum from uh, uh, John Bonham uh, and Led Zeppelin, like specific song. 
I've, you know, every little thing and how, not just the sound he was getting from the instrument, but how he was playing it, he could cite everything. Um, and, and, you know, music people can talk for hours and hours and hours about sort of like, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, it's not pedigree. Maybe, maybe pedigree is the right word. It's sort of like every little riff, every little jam, every little groove, every little beat has a sort of a pedigree of where it came from and and where it's been on the way uh, in between sort of like the original, um, you know, first time it was invented to, you know, when Justin Bieber uses it in his latest hit. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so it all has a story. But yeah, it's all related as well. There's uh, it's 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 a music is an amazing thing, right? Because just like DNA, you've only got like DNA, you've got four nucleotides and we get so much variety from it interestingly enough uh one of the reasons why i got into um sort of computational biology was 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 because i'm a musician and i learned about dna um so dna uh uh you know i studied classical music i grew up playing the cello and so i i, I learned about these things called fugues <clears throat> and, a, and a fugue is a thing where you take a melody and you base uh, the rest of the music on that melody with just minor changes to it. And so you can one thing you can so one thing you can do to that melody is you can you can take it and then you can overlay another copy of that melody a, above it at a different pitch, and that gives you harmony in the same melody. But another thing you can do is you can you can stretch it out, you can elongate it, you can make the melody take longer, you can make the melody take shorter periods of time, and you can also reverse it uh and so that you play the melody backwards or play it upside down like missy elliott yeah <laughs> um and you can do all these things but those are also the modifications you can do to dna uh those those and that and those they naturally occur it's not like uh js bach is playing right. our chromosomes right. but you can uh you know dna can by accident can flip can reverse itself it can mm -hmm. stretch it you can have insertions that stretch it out you can have deletions that shrink it down. All the all the modifications that could happen in a fugue, which I'd learned about, uh, you know, ever since I was a kid, I used to love listening to fugues, um, uh, like on the organ and whatnot. There's some real famous ones that you're probably familiar with. Even if you're not familiar with the term fugue, if you heard the uh, the, the the melody, you'd be if, like, oh, I know that one. If you felt like you needed to demonstrate a fugue on, say, a tenor guitar, I wish I could play one. That would be amazing. But, <laughs> but, but, it, but, the, in, but it's interesting that like genetics and you, you know, you bring up genetics and like, and music because they both have a finite number of, of things that can do, can happen. There's only, you know, uh, there's only so many beats in a bar, right? There's only so many notes in a scale and yet we get so much variety an infinite amount of variety. And there's, you know, it's funny when you think about pop songs, right? Uh, that how they're all about the same, not only are they using the same sort of like structures, they're also using the same lyrics, right? They're, they're all about love, right? Or like you left me or I fell in love with you. It's like those, it, th those yeah. two things encompass 99% of all <laughs> music right there. Um, and, and it's amazing how much infinite for, you know, how just like every person is different, how we can continue to, to make new songs. And we haven't run out of like, you know, it's like someone is like, oh, this is the last song. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> we we got them all. <laughs> no, it'll never be that way. There will always be new music. And that's, I, that's that infinite variety is is kind of mind blowing. Uh, yeah. I sometimes think about that with film names, with movie names. I'm like, are they going to run out? Or like, you're just like, we're just going to have to go back and call another movie the game. Because... <laughs> That's true. Um, uh, but yeah, but it, yeah, it is really crazy. That is also, it reminds me of a stat and it's kind of, it's just math, right? That because every, how many letters in the alphabet is it? 26, 24? Ooh. Person to ask. <laughs> There's 20-ish, 20 to 30 <laughs> letters in the alphabet. And so uh, for every additional character in a string, it's to the power, like, yeah, to the power of that number that I don't know in terms of the what, what the possibilities are. So like when you have only one letter, there's 26 possibilities. But then once you have two, it's 
26 times 26 or whatever the correct number is. That's not 26. Um, and so you very, very quickly with just like five characters, all of a sudden it's like an absurd number of possibilities. Um, and yeah, music is the same. DNA is the same. It's, uh, yeah, it's crazy. I do have a, um, I do have a funny, uh, maybe digression about the number of letters in an alphabet, but maybe it applies here. <laughs> when I was right out of uh, college, I, uh, I interviewed at Microsoft and, and they had me do something that involved the number of letters in the alphabet. And I couldn't remember what it was. And I can't remember it now either, but I remember just like the interviewer just started laughing at me <laughs> because I had all the math and it was off by like two two digits because i couldn't remember or something and i was like i was going a b c d e <laughs> counting on my fingers trying to figure it out and he was just like this is ridiculous how are you all how are you interviewing here and then you're like i can only count to g i'm a musician <laughs> I, I give up <laughs> um i just looked it up it's 26 so, but I bet it's super easy to think 24. I don't know why for me. I mean, why? you got for sometimes me. why, right? I mean, how do you count that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, how many vowels are there? It's, yeah, there is no, it's und undefined. Um, awesome. What a great answer to that question. Um, all right. So here's one from Nikolai Kurbatov, who is an AI product, an AI product manager. And he often has great questions for guests. So here's another one. Um, he's got three, but I'm going to pick the one of the three that's my favorite. And because this is one that has frequently boggled my mind. And we might end up going off on some interesting philosophical uh, quests here. So why do all of the data on a big scale look Gaussian almost all the time? I mean, is there a hidden law there or is this a kind of a mathematical uh, constant like pi? I know that the question could look stupid, but I'm really wondering about this thing. Also, I'm aware of the central limit theorem, but it's not enough for me to understand this phenomenon. Yeah, it, yeah but, but it's all rooted in the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem, uh, the simplest version of it is that means that the mean of something is gonna be normally distributed. Um, but, uh, but also what that means, uh, the, the mean is just a, a summation divided by a constant, right? So if we ignore that constant, we can say sums are also normally distributed. So the sum, Whoa. and that's why everything is normally distributed, like heights, the height of people, because we, uh, I mean, in a, in a, in a, uh, you know, you know, metaphor and not metaphorical, like. I don't know, weird sense. You could say, oh, we're the sum of a lot of things. But like, think of, like anything that your cells are doing is the sum of a lot of processes. And, and the effects as a result mean that the output is going to be normally distributed. And, mm -hmm. and that, and that just cascades to all kinds of things. So, so when we grow, um, you know, and you measure everybody in North America, you're going to see a nice normal curve uh, because everybody is basically the sum of tons and tons of, of things. And the outputs of all those summations are going to be normally distributed. Um, and so that's where it all comes from is just the fact that every process is, is, is the product of uh, not, if I say the product of a sum, it's confusing because that's math terminology. <laughs> a product is multiplication <laughs> is the, is the output of everything is, is a sum. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, everything totally. to make something it happen. It's, it's the sum, you know, underneath it, everything cellular is is a, is a summation, basically. So something that I think about a lot related to this, which I think also is a way to to show yourself that you can't possibly have free will, <laughs> <laughs> which is that if you think about almost any like thought that you have it kind of like for, for thoughts that you could like say put on um, on a scale of how, like how, how do you feel about this? So like something like gay marriage, if you asked people a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, you know, should there be gay marriage? It's like an extremely small percentage would have said, yeah, I'm fine with that. Or definitely I highly support that. But then like, if you look at a chart of, say, people in the U.S. over the last few decades, there's this dramatic swing. And we see it with, like, with anything, like legalizing marijuana, 
It's like we we are a oh, it's just a sum. We're a sum of all these influences, right? So you have what you see on TV and what the conversations that you have at work and the conversations that you have at home. And so it's the sum of all these interactions that you're like, all right, I guess people can smoke weed if they want to, or I guess anybody can get married if they want to. And, um, well, that's regression to the mean, isn't it? (laughs) Well, oh, now, now you're, you're, you're just being silly with language, but that's, because that's something completely different. Uh, well, in a lot of, well, I guess regression, well, hmm, that, oh no, I see exactly what you're saying. So I often think about regression to the mean with like my own behavior, which is what I was thinking about there with like, um, you know, if you do something out of character, you're likely to come back towards kind of mean, but um, if, yeah, but but yeah, you're right, at a population level. Or, yeah, that's what I was or, thinking. You start off with like things on an extreme and then they just sort of like percolate to the median to where it's where it's no longer thought of as extreme. It's 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 more just, you know, run of the mill at that point. That's it's it's sort of the average belief at that at some point. Yeah, but it, yeah. And it, and the the mean of that distribution is changing over time, though. So like if you pull everyone in the US in the 50s and then the 60s and then the 70s, they're like their opinion on how they feel about gay marriage or legalizing marijuana or whatever sh- is shifting. Um, and anyway, so yeah, I just find it interesting that it's like everything that I think and everything that I do is the product of some other interaction, fundamentally my genetics and then every single interaction that the environment has had with my genetics since, which also actually people want to, hear more about gene by environment interactions episode 547 which came out uh, about a month ago with professor jonathan flint uh, who specializes in that kind of work at ucla is pretty interesting but anyway uh so all right well yeah great answer and i and, I, and then i got to say that thing that i've been thinking about for a while with the uh, how we're just yeah no free will um <laughs> we, we do a whole episode on that um all right, so, and then one last question here for you. It was asked in a few different ways from different people, like Jonas Christensen, uh, who is an author, and um, Phil Fry, who is a, a chief data officer. So they're they all kind of asking the same question of like, what are the key stats fundamentals? So Jonas kind of asks it that way, what are the main fundamentals? But I actually really like the way Phil asks it is, Uh, what are the essentials of stats literacy that business people need to know? Uh, For me, the the, the most fundamental concept in stats, statistics that everyone needs to understand is variation. Um, It's funny because I remember for me, it was like a light bulb moment. Uh, When I was a kid, I never thought about variation. I never thought that like, things were different. My world was very small. It was, you know, I grew up in a small town. Um, you know, I had my friends and I just never thought about variation. I never, I never looked at flowers and thought all those flowers are different sizes and they're all like slightly different shades of yellow. I, I never thought about variation, but, but, but when I first started learning statistics, I, le- I realized that everything varies, every single thing in the whole world varies and statistics is a way to cope with that variation and, and to quantify it and to understand it and to take advantage of it. And I feel like it's, it is the core. I mean, is the core of statistics in my opinion is if, if you can, if you can understand that everything is always different and I, and that's kind of like a weird, like Zen thing, right? You know, the, the, ri- the, the same river <laughs> never flows under the bridge twice, you know, that kind of thing. No, but everything is always different. There's nothing consistent anywhere. And, and, and especially in business, you got manufacturing processes, you've got um, customer service stuff. It's all variable, right? Uh, and statistics gives us a way of understanding that, quantifying it, coping with it, and taking advantage of it. And so I think that's a key thing. The other thing for me conceptually was visualizing residuals in many different contexts. 
Um, that was once I was able to understand how a T test can be thought of in terms of residuals, how ANOVA can be thought of in terms of residuals, how regression can be thought of in terms of residuals. Once I understand it, the, understood that concept of like, it's all about the residuals, which are always different by the way. So there's a lot of variation there. Um, but once, once you can think about residuals, you can visualize all of statistics. You can just see it in your head. Um, and so those are the two, two main ideas that I think are the most valuable, uh, for anyone to know about statistics and especially in business or whatever, a place where you don't really want to, you don't want to be a statistician. You just want to be someone who doesn't freak out when someone says statistics. Um, <laughs> if you can, if you can visualize residuals and understand what that means and, and you understand that there's always going to be variation and you need to, you need to quantify it and understand what that you know, what does that variation mean? How does it going to affect your business? Um, yeah, those, that's, those are my, my two things. Love it. Great answer. And I agree. Those are awesome concepts for everyone to know. All right. So I think that wraps up the audience questions. So at the end of every episode, Josh, I ask for a book recommendation. I understand you have a great one. I have a fantastic book recommendation. I highly recommend the StatQuest Illustrated Guide to Machine Learning. Oh, come on. Available this spring. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, you know, anyways, obviously it's not out yet, so I can't really recommend it. With, uh, but, but I will say I'm a, uh, I'm a huge Neil Stevenson fan. I love reading Ooh. Neil Stevenson. I don't know if you read Neil Stevenson. Um, he's a science I've fiction. I've had it recommended to me many times. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, What's the, it's like, ah, oh, oh, geez, you're, one of his big ones. It's like Quantopia or something. Uh, Cryptonomicon. Like, yeah. Cryptonomicon. Yeah. yeah. He's not for everyone. I will say that he's not for everybody, but, and I, and I, I've talked to a lot of people that are like, yeah, I tried it. Didn't get into it, but I love it. I'll be, per, I'll be honest. What I love about his books is they're they're It's like, they're all huge. All his books are huge. I don't really like that, but what, what he does in, 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 in one book is he writes three, he writes one book that has an exciting plot line. He writes one book where he's world building. He's creating, you know, exquisite detail about a world that you, we've never been to before. It's amazing. The things are so real in his books. You could touch them. You could probably, you know, stub your toe on it in the dark. Um, and he's, he's just thought about things in such a deep way. And he's describes it so clearly uh, so I love the world building. Like he invents an entire universe just to write a book. And the last thing he does is, is it's a, it's a, it's a philosophy book. He spends a lot of time sort of asking philosophical questions and trying to answer them. He doesn't shy away from stuff like that. And, That's and it's, cool. and it's for those three reasons. Like, uh, I mean, some people, you know, a lot of people complain when they're reading Neil Stevenson that they love the action adventure part, but then they get bogged down during the philosophy part and they lose interest. Uh, or they get bogged down in the world building and they're like, it's too many details or whatever. I, the, to me, I love all three of those things because I love sort of imagining, fantasizing about being somewhere different and what would it be like, uh, especially if you're in the future, you know, I, it's, it's fun to really think about, I don't know. I just, I've always been interested in the future and the way he paints the picture of the future is so vivid that I love that. And, and I love the philosophy because it makes me think and I love thinking. So I'm um, like any, just He's got a new book that came out like a month ago or no, excuse me. It came out in November called, um, termination shock. I'm reading that right now. Uh, uh, I, of the ones that I've read, that's one of my favorites. I, and I mispronounced the name of it. It's called Ananthem or Anathem. I don't know how it's pronounced, uh, but mm. I, I love it. Uh, I've read it twice. I've actually read everything he's written twice. So, uh, Wow. I, I endorse Neil Stevenson. That sounds like an epic recommendation. I have been looking for some fiction to dig into recently, and now this has got to go top of the list. Um, yeah, thank you for that great explanation of why his books are so good. Um, so, yeah, that's it. This has been an epic, epic episode. Uh and so the only thing left to ask you is how people should follow you. So it seems like you're doing something on YouTube or something and they should maybe check that out. <laughs> um, I do. So I do, I do YouTube uh, videos and if, 
and if and that's your thing, you should definitely check it out. Uh, but if it's not your thing, and it's not everybody's thing, I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn, and I also do uh, like I'll put like I don't know, I call them flashcards, you know, like little, you know. So if you you can, st- there's still value in following me, even if you hate videos and you hate silly songs. <laughs> um, there's still some value in following me on those other platforms because you there's 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 cool stuff coming out that is unique and not just ex- you know not just sort of like rehashing that's on the video. Nice. I love it. Well, we're going to have to have you back on the program sometime because we didn't earn a triple bam today. So, oh, no, <laughs> triple bam. <laughs> no, we can't just squeeze it in at the end like that. So we'll have to have you on the show again sometime, Josh. It's been so amazing having you on. So much fun. I've learned so much, had so many laughs. Yeah. Can't wait to do it again. Looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a real honor and I just, it's been a great time. I had a great conversation. Wow, wow, wow. I was excited to meet Josh, a personal icon of mine, and he did not disappoint. He is clearly deeply intelligent on a broad range of topics, unbelievably creative, and a model communicator. In today's episode, Josh filled us in on his reading to math to simple implementation approach to learning something, how when coming up with a way to teach a concept, he focuses on what would have been helpful to him when he first learned it, how he uses R for quickly prototyping while he might use Python for more involved work, how you can cluster any types of data using the R random forest package, and that in his opinion, the two stats concepts that everyone should know are variance and residuals. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Josh's YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter accounts, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 553. That's superdatascience.com slash 553. If you'd like to ask questions of future guests of the show, like several audience members did of Dr. Starmer during today's episode, then... Consider following me on LinkedIn or Twitter as that's where I post who upcoming guests are and ask you for your thoughtful inquiries. All right. Thank you to Ivana, Mario, Jaime, JP, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another extraordinary episode for us today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon.